How many of y'all got some conflict in your life? Now, when you got conflict in your life, it's hard to it's it's hard to kind of bring it together and and um, and and resolve it. In fact, we tend to kind of when we have conflict, we tend to do one of two things. Sometimes we dig our heels in. Most how many of you are heel diggers? When we have conflict, we dig. How many how many heel diggers do we got? I'm a heel digger. I want to dig my heels in, and I want to be right. And by golly, I'm going to be right, okay? I'm a heel digger. The other thing we do is we have people that don't like the heel diggers, and we just sort of, we want to avoid conflict. How many conflict avoiders do we have? Okay, so what happens when you put a conflict avoider and a heel digger together in the same room? We don't get resolution, do we? We dig in, we dig in, and we dig in. We're going to learn something that is so fundamental to who we are as people of faith. This is very, very important. It's about what does it mean to be a peacemaker? It's a big deal in our life. It's not just a big deal in who we are as humans and how this impacts us in terms of our own lives, our families, the work that we do. This is so important to who we are as people of God. This is one of those fundamental things that we have to get right, and we're going to learn about it from an unlikely place. One of the great councils of the church. We're back into our study of Acts. In Acts 15, it talks about the council of, in Jerusalem, one of the pivotal moments in the life of the church, and we're going to study that today, and we're going to learn something about our own lives and who we are as the people and the children of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your spirit in our midst. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for the word that transforms us into your image every day. I thank you for all of these things. I'm amazed at your power. I'm amazed at your wisdom, your beauty, all of the things that you are to us, God. We are amazed by them. We bless you, and we thank you for them in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 15. Let's remind ourselves what's been going on. Can we put that slide up of the, uh, of the journeys of Paul? Just to remind ourselves, great persecution has been happening in Jerusalem. The power of the Holy Spirit has fallen. The church has been dispersed throughout the Mediterranean region. People have left. Uh, Peter begins his journey. He goes out to Joppa. It's there that he meets Corne uh, 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 he's, he's He has this divine uh, impression that that the gospel, if you remember, there was a, there was a time when the, a great sheet descended. He has this dream, this vision that the gospel is to go to the Gentiles. So it's, and then at the same time, uh, uh, Cornelius, who was up in, in uh, Caesarea, he also has this, this, this visitation, this dream that he's supposed to send men down to Joppa to, to, uh, to, to, to connect with Peter. And then they bring him back up to Caesarea and... and uh, uh, the Gentiles are, uh, the, all of the house of Cornelius is saved. So the gospel begins to move forward, and the gospel moves forward up into Antioch, and, and uh, believers up there, it was actually uh, Christians from the, from the island of Cyprus that plant a church up in Antioch. It begins to spread and to grow, and there's all of this growth, and Paul does his first little missions trip through there. He's returned. He's gone up to Perga, up to, to uh, Sidian Antioch, to Iconium, Lystra. He goes back, and now he's back into Antioch. Paul, remember, was the was the great apostle to the Gentiles. He began as Saul. He's a Jew. He's a Pharisee. He was persecuting the Christians in the, in the very beginning, and he's dramatically changed. Now he's one of the great heroes of the faith, the, the apostle to the Gentiles. And now he's, up in, uh, he's been up into Antioch now for some time. He's been up in Antioch for some time. And preaching the gospel. And what happens is these pesky Judaizers, we're going to read a lot about them. They're Pharisees. Now, remember, a lot of the Pharisees got saved. So these are Christian Jews. They align themselves with the, with the party of the Pharisees. It would have been sort of a political, religious party, sort of like we would have, you know, Democrats and Republicans. That's sort of how it was in their culture. They would be Pharisees. And, and so these are Pharisees. These are Christians but they're, they're the ones that often are raising a lot of the problems in the church as they struggle. They're wrestling through culture and faith and how all of these things connect in this new Christian movement. So with that as a backdrop, let's read uh, from Matthew. Or Matthew, I'm in Matthew here. That's the wrong. Ma Matthew 25 is good too. or Matthew, But that's not where we are. Matthew, uh, Acts 15. 
Here's what it says. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So what these guys are doing is they're, these are the Judaizers that I was talking about. They're men. They come when they say down from Jerusalem. It was Jerusalem was sat on a hill, but also it was sort of part of the idea that was was that Jerusalem was the 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 city of Zion. It was sort of above everything. So when they came down to it, even though they're going north to Antioch, um, people would use that that language to say they're coming down from it. And so these Jews, these Pharisees are going into Antioch and they're saying you have to be circumcised in order to be saved now it seems weird to us 2,000 years removed from this story but it's really important for us to understand this if we're going to understand what's happening in these in these narratives um, faith at that time was so bound up in in their culture so in other words to be a Jew meant to be first of all you were part of a community part of a there was a there was a nation of Jews now they were dispersed and they were spread around but they still saw themselves as a culture as a context as a people a Jewish people a nation but at the same time it was also a religion it was bound up it was one and the same thing we don't tend to think of that that way so in other words we're Americans and we are Christians but we don't necessarily there's lots of Americans, obviously, who are not Christians, and more and more there's lots of Americans who have all different kinds of faith these days, don't, isn't there? So for us, we have to understand, if we're going to understand these contexts, we have to understand that for them what it meant to be a Jew was that you had a, a certain religious perspective and you also had a national perspective. Now that these Jews are being saved, they've got a problem because now they're, 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 they're becoming they're Christians now, but they still belong to a nation. So they're trying to figure out how does this new faith, how does, what does it mean to be Jewish, no longer adhere to the Jewish religion, but be Christian? What does that mean? So in other words, we can look back on this now 2,000 years in the future and, and maybe miss the whole point. We may go, oh, those silly Jews, of course you don't have to be circumcised. But they would see themselves still as Jewish people. So it was a, complex, a complicated cultural context that we need to understand. So these Judaizers, these men from Jerusalem, they're acting out of good faith. They believe that in order for them to be circumcised, they, in, in order for them to be saved, they have to be circumcised. And, and so we're going to look at that a little bit more, a little bit more later. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. Now, so, so this, has been, this has been going on now for several years, and, and there's, there's these, these, these real divisive things. This, this issue has actually already been settled. It's been talked about quite a bit, but it's growing to a head because more and more and more Gentiles are being saved. And the, these communities of Jewish faith are saying, well, if you're going to be Christian, you have to first be circumcised. So they go back down into Jerusalem to talk to the, to the apostles and the, and the elders of the Jerusalem church. That was sort of the, the main place where people would go to. Um, that, that was the head of the church. That's the, the center of the faith at this point. The church, that is the church in Antioch, sent them on their way as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they, uh, down on the, on the, 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 the regions that they're traveling through, and told how the Gentiles had been converted. The news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God that God had done through them. So Paul and Barnabas and people that are coming with them, they're traveling south to go down to Jerusalem to talk to the elders, to talk to the, the apostles. Along the way, they're telling everybody, about this remarkable thing that's, go that's been going on. People are being saved. People are being delivered. People are being healed. It's a remarkable outpouring of God's power. And along the way, people are rejoicing. So as they come into Jerusalem, everybody gathers around. They're excited about what's happening. It's a remarkable thing. So they're telling everybody. There's a sort of big welcoming committee. It's all very exciting. Anybody ever had something that was super, super exciting only to have somebody ruin it? Well, that's what's about ready to happen. Then some of the believers, note that. These are believers. These are Christian people. These are, these are people that would, that would believe that Jesus is Lord just like we would. 
Some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So these pesky Pharisees, what, what were also known as Judaizers, these Judaizers that, that were up in Antioch, now some of them probably followed them all the way down. Some of them are probably in Jerusalem already. But this controversy is really beginning to rage. After much discussion... Do you get the sense of what's happening there? They're in this sort of this public arena. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. Do these new Gentile Christians have to forego circumcision? Y'all know what circumcision is? If you don't, go ask your mother. Um, you can imagine if, you're, if you were saved, if you're a, a Gentile man and you got saved and you got saved with the doctrines of grace... Now, all of a sudden, to be told you have to go do this procedure, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm going to push back on that pretty hard. <laughs> you know, you're probably not too enthused about it because you're saying, first of all, I don't want to do that. Second of all, it's not consistent with what I got saved in in the first place. I got saved according to God's grace. I recognize, I understand the claims of the gospel, and I believe it. That saves me. So this is, a, this is an important debate. Um, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders meant to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Now, now remember who Peter is. I, just, I, I talked a little bit about Peter. Peter was the guy, Paul at one point would call Peter the, the apostle to the Jews. He's really the one that got this ball rolling. It was him that had the vision that the gospel was to go to the Gentiles. It was him that went to Cornelius' house. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. So it was Peter that went to the centurion's house where there was this huge outpouring of God's spirit. People spoke in tongues. This, and this whole, as, as a sign of the gospel of Jesus being effective and impacting their heart the holy spirit comes they're saved he has to actually go take this crazy event he has to go back to jerusalem and explain it to everybody it's one of the things that we learn about god god does weird things sometimes and he doesn't have to explain himself to us that's a big lesson that we need to learn this is one of those examples where god does some weird stuff all of these all of these gentiles Ro these are romans by the way people don't jews don't like romans Romans were the occupying force. So Peter has already walked through this with, with the council at Jerusalem. He's already been there before, talking to them again about, you know, talking to them about all of the events that happened in Caesarea. And now he's here again. You can almost sort of, you get a picture of who Peter is. Remember now, Peter was the hothead. He was, he was the guy that would just sort of, you know, shoot from the hip and, and, and you know, bear, shoot him, just shoot from the hip and bury him later. He was that guy. But now we see a much different Peter beginning to emerge. Note his patience. Note his kindness, his love, his wisdom. Here's what he says. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. He's talking about the events that happened in Caesarea with Cornelius and his family. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinctions between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? This yoke, this yoke of circumcision, the yoke of the law, at one point Jesus says, don't, work, don't, work, don't mess with that yoke. He said, take on my yoke. Remember when he said that? Take on my yoke. Listen to my words. My burden is light. My yoke is light. Come if you're weary, and I'll give you rest. So in contrast to the Mosaic law, the, and it, by the way, it doesn't mean that the law was bad. It doesn't even mean that circumcision was bad. What happened was when people steal their hearts against God, when they harden their hearts towards God, then that yoke becomes very heavy. Jesus came to give us a new heart. That was the promise of Jeremiah. He says, I'm going to give you a new heart. Instead of this hard rock heart, I'm going to give you a heart that's tender and soft, fleshy. So, so the, the people of Israel had hardened their heart against circumcision, the law of Moses, and it became a burden. Jesus came to give us a new heart. 
It's, it's, it's the new covenant. That's what he does in us. So what Peter is saying is we're not going to go back to that old, that old yoke. We're not going to go back to that old heart. Peter is saying this yoke is, this, this is the good yoke of Jesus, the light yoke, where Jesus is yoked with us. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul tell about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Now imagine they're, they're debating. There's all of this going on. They're debating uh, the theological nuances. Should they be circumcised? Should they not? Paul and Barnabas get up. And they begin to talk about what God is doing. It's very important for us to understand that we're never going to compress God into our theological systems. We're never going to do it. It doesn't work. We're not going to compress God into our systematic theology. He's bigger than that. Now, it's good for us to try to understand who God is and what does he do and why does he do it. We're supposed to know him. But when we try to make God work according to our systems, I think it deeply offends God. And what happens is Paul and Silas just sort of, or Paul and Barnabas rather, just get up and they start talking about what God's doing. Sometimes we need to sort of maybe park our theology a little bit and just look at what God does. And the whole assembly is silent. See, when God does stuff, that's what captures the attention. That's what captures the heart of humans. It's when God is doing those remarkable things. That will preach more than a thousand sermons. That will will teach more than a thousand books written on theology. It's the power and the might of a God who came to heal, to deliver, to set captives free, to take crusty, rock-hard hearts, yank them out and put in hearts that are soft, malleable, fleshy. When we see the hand and the work of God, it speaks so much more than any theological concept. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Let's remind ourselves who James is. There's three Jameses. There's James, the son of Alphaeus. That would have been one of the disciples. There's James, the, uh, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. He's one of those sons of thunder. He was in the inner circle of Jesus. This is James, the brother of Jesus. Different ideas. Most evangelical theologians tend to agree that, that, that Joseph and Mary had normal relations and that, and that James was uh, the younger brother of Jesus. Jesus had four brothers and, and several sisters. We don't know exactly how many. Um, and that's, that's probably true. I got to tell you, I think that evangelicals have sort of dismissed a lot of orthodox and historical theology that said that James was, uh, was, a, was a, 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 a brother, was a son of Joseph and would have been quite a bit older. So he wasn't a biological uh, brother of, Je- of Jesus. He would have been a much older uh, stepbrother. And some, even John Calvin speculated that he was a cousin. Sometimes I think that's probably true, but that's just me personally. Um, but we know for sure he's a brother of Jesus. But when you see James speak and talk and, and the way he interacted with Jesus, he seems to me like sort of a, a distant, more of a distant relative of Jesus, like an older, but that's just me. He was a really godly guy. He didn't believe in Jesus before. Um, he, wasn't the, he wasn't at the crucifixion. He abandoned, you know, he abandoned his brother. He didn't believe. They actually kind of made fun of Jesus a little bit when, during his earthly ministry. But Jesus appeared to him in his resurrected form. After Jesus was, was resurrected, he appeared to James. And a big change happened in James. Now he, he's, a, he's a just man. It was said of James that his, his knees looked like camel's knees because he prayed so much. He was constantly on his knees praying. 
he was so he was so influential in Jerusalem that the Pharisees these would these were the Pharisees that were not Christians. The Pharisees uh, they uh, um, they executed him. They threw him down from the top of the temple. He landed on the courtyard, and he didn't quite die. And the legend is, is that they begin to stone him there. And while they're stoning, he's praying for the people who are killing him. One guy said, stop, 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 stop. He's praying for us. And the, the legend is, is one of the leaders took a staff and whacked him in the head with it. And that's how he died when he, was a, when he was an older man. About 12 years. This story happens about 50, uh, about 20 years after Jesus died and and James dies about 12, 12 years after this story. So James is a remarkable guy, a, 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 an influential man, an important man, a holy, a spiritual man. When James talks, people listen. When they finished speaking, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described as how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. What he's saying is really important. And, and the fact that he's saying Simon, it might be that, that what Luke, who is the writer of this, maybe what Luke is wanting us to get is that this, this whole council is being carried on in Aramaic. Jewish people would speak either Hebrew or mostly Aramaic. So, so Simon would be an Aramaic word for, uh, of his, his name. Jesus gave him the name Peter. But, so, so James is calling him by his, by his natural tongue, by his, by his given name of Simon. You ever, have, you ever have somebody that calls you by your formal name? It's usually your mother when you're in trouble, you know. My name is Dorman, Dorman James. Everybody calls me Jim. Um, but I know I'm in trouble or I'm being talked to when somebody says, Dorman, Dorman James. It kind of shows authority. Do you guys have those people in your life? When I, when, when I read this, and this is just me, when I read this, it seems like an older man speaking to a younger man, calling him by his formal given name, Simon. It's just speculation. I don't know for sure. He says, brothers, listen to me. Simon has described us. So Simon is Peter. How God first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. It's really important. The, the whole concept of Jewish theology with, was that God was calling for himself a people. And the sign of that was circumcision. So it's really important to understand that it was a patriarchal culture. So they would circumcise the male babies eight days after they were born. So th that's how God called out his people through circumcision. And, and that's why, that's the whole narrative of Jewish, Jewish theology. You're different. You're called out. God brought you out of Egypt. He's calling to himself a people. He says, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and, and rebuild... Uh, um, he's concerned by taking from the let me finish that thought here taking from the Gentiles a people for himself so this would be really remarkable theology because the Jewish theology was that they were the people that God is calling for himself now what James is saying is is that God is expanding the hoop he's calling for himself a people from the Gentiles that would be a huge shift in Jewish theology because they were the people they were the people called out of Egypt, not the, not the Gentiles. They were the people that were delivered. They were the city on the hill, not the Gentiles. So for God now, for James, to, God to speak through James and say that God is spread, is, is enlarging the hoop, that would be a remarkable shift. So now the Gentiles are being separated as a holy people, as were the Jews. And this is consistent with Amos. Amos was an, an ancient prophet that had written hundreds of years before this story. And here's what Amos wrote. He says, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, I will restore it. That the remnant of men seek the Lord and all the Gentiles will bear my name, says the Lord. And who does these things that have been known for the ages? Says the Lord who does these things throughout the ages. So what James is saying is this is consistent with Jewish theology. We all knew there would be a day when God expanded the family of God. Amos himself spoke of it. So James is saying, look, we, this, this was prophesied about. It is my judgment, James continues, therefore... That we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. 
For Moses had been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, i got to be honest with you. I've struggled with that. Didn't we just say that people were only saved by grace? Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I read this, I'm like, it's, it sounds to me like what James is doing. He says, okay, here's, the, th- here's, the, here's the, the theology that we're saved by grace. But it seems like, like James is just going to kind of throw in a little bit of legalism there just to kind of make everybody happy. But it's sort of like me saying, you know, you are saved only by grace. But here's some things I'd really like you to do every day just to sort of make sure it's stuck. I'm like, come on, James. And in fact, we know that James struggled with this. The way we know it is because Paul wrote about it in Galatians. Paul said that James had sent some men. This was, this was what's happening in Acts 11. We looked at that a little bit earlier. There were men that came to kind of see what's going on, and, and James struggled with this. Peter struggled with it. The, 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 the apostles, they struggled with this concept. The leaders of the church in Jerusalem, they struggled with it. And again, it's easy for us to sort of point our fingers at it, but this was a big deal to them. This was their culture. This was their life. It sort of be, it, and we have some of that in our own culture. There are sometimes I'll hear people that will talk about immigrants, for instance, and they'll say, well, they need to learn the language, and they need to, they need to do this, and they need to eat our food, and they need to drive like we do, and we want them to act like we do, and we want them to eat like we do. They need to come into our culture. When there's nothing in our culture that mandates that, there's, there's nothing in the constitution of our country that says an immigrant has to do these things. And yet we sort of feel like they should. This is what's happening in the Jewish culture. So what James is doing is not just sort of saying, here's the declaration, the proclamation of the gospel, and then sprinkling a little legalism on top. He's doing something that's profound and something that's very important. It was needed in that culture, and it is very needed in our culture, here's what he's doing. He's being a peacemaker. He's finding some compromise. Because for hundreds and hundreds of years, dating back 500 years before this story, the, the, the Jewish people had been scattered throughout the regions. So in almost all of these Greek communities, there were pockets of Jewish, Jewish communities. And they would build their synagogues and they would teach the law of Moses. And now these Gentiles were coming into these Jewish communities. And they were rightfully saying, we're saved by grace. We're saved because of the power of Jesus. But they were ignoring rich, important things that were very much a part of the Jewish culture. And what James is saying, he's he's making a compromise. A compromise that the church embraced. Peter embraced it. Paul embraced it. Paul wrote about it extensively in all of his letters. And he says there's things that we want Gentile believers to be sensitive to as they begin to come into this new faith. Christianity is not the Jewish faith, but it is deeply entrenched in Judaism. And people need to be sensitive to it. Basically what he's saying is this. No, you're not saved through circumcision. That's not how God calls to himself a people anymore. The way that God calls to himself a people is divine. It's supernatural. He takes the, 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 the stony, the hard heart out and places in it a new heart. That's how we come into the family of God. It's now celebrated by an outward ceremony of baptism. By the way, that's why we baptize men and women. Because the gospel of Jesus liberates everybody. And shame on any church that, that maintains the vestiges of a, of, of a pre-resurrection culture. Jesus was raised and he set everybody free. And women are empowered just as men are to preach the gospel, to anoint the sick, to heal the broken. That's why we baptize men and women. Because they're all in the family of God. There's a new way now, is what James is saying. There's a new way that God is calling to himself a people. It's divine. He says, but as you are coming into this, be sensitive 
to other believers. In a sense, what he's saying is, hey, they're struggling with this. This is a big deal. This is, this is thousands of years of culture. You can't just sort of, you know, come in and start trampling on everybody's beliefs and be patient with them. James wrote a lot about patience, love. Take your time. What he's doing, he's compromising. It's not very popular in our culture these days. Doesn't take very long to look around and and you can see we need it, right? Can we all agree with that? We're we're fighting about everything, right? I think just this weekend, a, a religious group, I don't I'm not I can't really call them Christian, is picketing another church, picketing a church, because they see what they're doing is different and wrong. Right? We can't agree on anything. Our culture's deeply divided. We see it in politics. I don't I don't talk a lot about politics, but we see it in politics. I do have a conviction about politics. We, what we tend to do as people is we don't like compromisers. For one party, they might call him a rhino, Republican in name only. Well, because he's trying to get along with some other people. And on the other side, they might call him blue dog Democrats. Not very many of those left. Because here's what we do. We tend to elect the people that most fiercely and strongly are going to protect our ideology so we, we elect the most progressive people or we elect the most conservative people. We put them all in a room together and then we complain about them when they don't get anything done. Let me ask you this. How much sense does that make? It doesn't make a bit of sense. Frankly, it kind of honks me off a little bit. The question we need to ask, regardless of what political side you're on, the question you need to ask is this. Not does that candidate support everyone, every bit of my ideology. Is, is that person a peacemaker? Can that person help us get to yes? And if the answer is no, stop voting for him. It's not fair to them. We can't elect people that are going to dig in their heels and then complain when they do. How much sense does that make? Not a bit. So James is doing something that's really unpopular in our culture. We do it in the church. We have all of these little theo. Well, this person is Presbyterian. He's a Methodist. He's a Baptist. He's a you know uh, he's a charismatic. She's a charismatic. Um, Catholics. We have all these different little. And if they don't see theology the same way we we dig in our heels, we divide up. We get into our camps. Nope. That person's too weird. That church isn't weird enough. Over there, I'm going to throw in with the Presbyterians. I can drink beer over there. Forget about those Baptists. They're no fun. We dig in our heels, don't we? We want everything to be just like we want it to be. But we live in a fallen world, and we're never going to get there. We're never going to see it. There's only one, there's only one time when everything will line up the way we think it should. And Jesus actually spoke of it. Because the narrative of Jewish theology out of which Christian theology came was that we are a people, a people of God with all of the promises and all of the blessings given to us. And you know how Jesus described peacemakers? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, if you're saved, you're a son or a daughter of God. But if you are not a peacemaker, you, there will always be a block from you and what God has declared you to be. Always. If you harbor bitterment, if you harbor resentment, unforgiveness, all of the things that, that, are, that are so much a part of a broken, fallen world, if you dig your heels in or if you duck and run, you will never understand who you are in Christ. And I'm at a place now in my life, I just want to read the Bible and just do what it says. The Bible says I should be able to heal. The Bible says I should be able to set the captives free. The Bible says that I have authority over darkness. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. 
But if I harbor resentment, if I'm not a peacemaker, I'm never going to know who I am. Paul would write about this later. He says, we are co-heirs with Jesus. That means that everything that Jesus gets, I get. Everything that Jesus did, I do. In other words, I'm supposed to live a lot more like Jesus and a whole lot less like Christians. It's because we harbor resentment, bitterness, anger. We dig our heels in, and it blocks us from God. You will never walk in authority. You will never walk in power unless you learn how to get rid of that junk. That's all there is to it. Blessed are the peacemakers. And church, I am convinced it is no more necessary than today. What that means, as Crosspoint Church begins to walk in more fullness of understanding some of these concepts, it means we are going to be flooded with people that will see life differently. They'll see social issues differently. They'll see, they'll see sexuality differently. They'll see culture differently. There's going to be a whole lot of stuff. And we're going to be peacemakers. Because that's what we're called to do. And that's what our culture needs. And I want to be the pastor of a church that walks in the full knowledge of who we are in Jesus Christ. Sons and daughters of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Money.